I'm Tom Stewart, Executive Director of the National Center for the Middle Market at The Ohio State University Fisher College of Business. With me is Ralph Greco, who is the Director of the Business Analytics Initiative here at Fisher at Ohio State. And we're here to discuss a new research document that we worked on together called How Digital Are You? The subtitle of this might be, Are You Digital Enough? I'm going to ask Ralph to describe the study a little bit, but let me begin by sort of telling you a little bit about the National Center for the Middle Market and a little bit about why we undertook the study. We were founded in 2011 to study mid-sized companies. That's 200,000 companies with revenues between 10 million a year and a billion a year, which collectively account for a third of U.S. employment and GDP. So it's the middle third of the U.S. economy. It's a very important, critical sector of the economy because it accounts for most of the growth of the economy. Middle market companies grow faster than either big businesses or small businesses, and yet they're relatively understudied. As we looked to the middle market, one of the issues that we clearly saw emerging of great importance to executives and therefore of great importance to the economy is how effectively, how completely they are participating in and whether or not they are leading the digital revolution and the digital transformation of U.S. business. So with Ralph and with the Magento company and the Next Trade group from California, we undertook a study of middle market executives asking them, how digital are you? Ralph, talk a little bit about the study and some of its top line findings. Yeah, the uh, study is kind of interesting, right? It was really to gauge uh, individual companies' interests and their practices and the methods they're using around becoming a digital company, or are they a digital company already? Uh, we were lucky enough to get 500 companies to respond and give us some ideas about the practices they had in place, their individual readiness as companies, uh, as well as part of this. And that was interesting from a standpoint, at least for me, is trying to understand where people thought they were on the spectrum of being ready or to be a digital company. So when you talk about digitization, or when I think about digitization, part of me thinks about you know, closing the books, running the systems, keeping, keeping the lights on digitally, and parts of, it, parts of me think about additive print manufacturing, 3D printing, mm -hmm. big data analytics. When, you, when we ask this question, what were we looking at? I think it, a couple of things. First of all, you have to back up a little bit because there are ways to become digital ready that we can almost describe it as waves, right? Mm -hmm. Initial wave was people looking at back office functions. So how are we doing our ERP? How are we closing our books every night? How are we doing our finances? A lot of people looked at that originally as a way to become digital. Are right? we getting rid of the green eye shades and replacing it with a green screen, Something, right? That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And some of that was, it was driven, it was almost they were driven to it, right? Because everybody else was doing it. In order to compete in that particular space, whatever their company was, they needed to follow that first wave. And then what we saw is you have people that, are, that did those kind of digital implementations. And you have others now that are looking at what I would consider the second wave, which is how are we gonna look at that forward-facing work that we do as a company? So it might be innovation, analytics, things that you were just talking about. How do we rapid prototyping now using new digital tools? These are a little different, right? I mean, there's good cost savings in the first wave, absolutely, right? People did it for a reason. They did it for a reason for security, for the way that they're gonna maintain their data, but there was also good cost savings in it. Now, instead of saving just money for the company, is there ways to make additional revenue streams by looking outward using these digital tools that are available to them so, and finding new opportunities. So top line, how important is digitization to mid-sized companies? Uh, if you looked at most of the companies, this is funny, we still have some that don't think it is important, mm -hmm. but a majority of the companies thought that digitization was key to their success, right? Um, and if there's some studies that are just coming out recently, it's funny, now that we've created our study, mm -hmm. you look at other things that are coming out, Red One Today that came out, large consulting firm referred to the fact that if more companies would use digital capabilities and training and tools available to them, increase in GDP across the globe of roughly $2 trillion by the year 2020. That's um, not chump change. That is correct. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's $500 billion alone for companies that would grasp better onto digital training and using more from an IT standpoint that is now digital based. So if it's important, yes, um, and if they're spending a lot, and I think the number in the report is that the median or the, the average middle market company is spending 12% of revenue on IT Correct. and expects that to go up 16.7% or seven, right. you know, so, so, so it's a big hunk of change already and it's going up probably faster than anything else uh, in the budget. 
how are they doing? Or, or first, where are they spending it? Are they spending it on the first wave or are they spending it on the second <laughs> yeah, wave? Yeah, great question. I think part of it is you still have companies that are gonna to continue to spend on the first wave. One of the things that came out of the study is the length of time it takes to do some of these digital implementations, right? One we of the, all know that, right. right? And in some cases, it was a little longer than they expected. The returns are still outstanding. When you see a, an ROI of, of greater than 28% in the 30% range as, as talked about in the study, great ROI, just a little longer time. So some are still finishing up this first wave. Mm -hmm. You have others that are now looking, okay, great, we have finished that. Now where can we focus our attention and our budget and our time and our effort and more importantly, our skills on what are the next things that we want to go after? So, so clarify one other thing for me before we sort of go into how companies rate themselves on digitization. <laughs> I understand the back office. Okay. Right? I'm replacing the clerks with computers. I, even, I understand running the current business, customer relationship management, um, logistics, tight, running, a, running a tighter shop, moving my operations more effectively, uh, and, and being able to track my current business right. more. And I certainly right. understand the role of, of, of IT there. Right. As we move out into this bleeding edge of innovation, how can IT help me innovate? As we move out into big data and analytics, what's that gonna do to help me not just count today's business, but invent tomorrow's business? Okay, that's a great question, right? So if we, let's take it in two parts, right? Part of it is, how can IT help? Part of the other question is, it may be, what are those things we're gonna focus on? You brought up one of them, which is big data and analytics. Mm -hmm. So let's just take analytics. Um, even very small companies can use analytics to do better things, right? If you have a call center, we're gonna use analytics to better adjust how many employees we have working in a call center. What types of calls are coming in? How we feel the call is going? Do we need to immediately move it to somebody else to help, you know, help it through the process? IT is a major component of this because, A, they either own the centers in some cases, B, they're the ones that run the applications that the call center's using, mm -hmm. and C, they own the data itself and can help with the applications that look at sentiment, look at some of the other things that come out of the call you center. You know, it's funny, I right. just had lunch the other day at a Shake Shack in Grand Central Station in New York at lunchtime, okay. so it was mobbed. Uh, I go and place my order, I get a little piece of paper with the order, and, it, and I looked at it and it said I placed my order at 12.38. Mm -hmm. I go and pick up my order. When I go and pick up my order, it told me that I picked up my order at 12.43. So it was a seven minute gap. And I looked at these two things and I'd never noticed this before and I realized they've got that for every order mm -hmm. and they've got that for every order in every Shake Shack, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And they're able to say, was this too long? I don't know what their target time is. Is it mm -hmm. five minutes, seven minutes, 10, mm -hmm. whatever it is. But you know, do we need more people on the shift? Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to rearrange the fryer and something in mm -hmm. the back because we're having a problem in this Shake Shack versus that Shake Shack. So they're able to do all kinds of stuff with that that can really, it, part of it can just fine tune the operations. Correct. But part of it might even be bigger and allow them to invent all kinds of new ways of serving me. Right? Well, part of it is, so let's take that example. So you go to Steak Shack, right? You've ordered your food. I order mine as well too. Mm -hmm. All right, so now our orders are slightly different. So let's collect all these orders from all the Steak Shacks like you described. Now I start looking at possible combinations that people have been ordering that I never thought of as a combo that people would want. Maybe there's this combo where all they want is a chocolate shake and fries because they're gonna take their fries and dip them in a shake. And that's the combo they want. I, I don't even want to go there. Right, but, people, <laughs> but, pe but people do, right? So that might be a new combo where they're saying, can we price it? Can we sell it? Can, mm -hmm. we, can we offer this combo at times of day when normally that isn't the, the things that they're ordering from us? Meaning I have at a steak shack, I have only so many things that can make milkshakes at once. Mm -hmm. I have to optimize the use of those devices. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that they don't break down. I have to manage how many I make during the day, during a time frame, how often do I replace and repair them, do maintenance on it. This is all analytics can help drive that. So it's this interesting combination is I can use some of that data to drive marketing, to drive new sales. I can use that data to help me maintain my equipment mm -hmm. and make sure that I don't have a breakdown. I can use some of it to gauge what people are doing. So what, what, what are the new things people like you are ordering? Yeah, right? now, if, if I'm ordering add... the chocolate shake and the crinkle fries, that, I mean, we're not even going to talk about yeah, that. Okay. We, we really have to go to another. Okay. But if we go into sort of science fiction science of area, the other thing I'm thinking about just in the new business environment is, is the opportunities with, with additive printing. And you know, I was mm. just imagining a not too distant future where a person goes into a hospital for a hip replacement, the doctor does the x-ray, 
and sends the data to the room next to the OR, and while the patient is being prepped, they're printing his hip. Mm -hmm. and, and you really are talking about a whole new, new kind of business yeah. and, a, and a real innovation, and it's driven by digitization. Yeah, absolutely, and, and again, 3D printing's fun, right? I mean, you've seen, yeah. uh, there's a young person in New Albany, Ohio, that just created an entire prosthetic hand, mm -hmm. right, using 3D printing. And again, it drives innovation because people's minds can become limitless because what they used to think I have to custom make, instead I just have to be able to design, I can let the printer create it for me, right? So my skill mm -hmm. is not in the creation, it's in the design of the product, allowing something else to do the creation for them. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of an offset in a particular place, but I can see lots of companies trying to do that. If we are, if you and I had a business today, and we're trying to compete in a, in a hand soap or somebody that makes some kind of luxury items, we could have all our containers prototype for us and try again and again and again to decide what shape we like, what lid did we like, what kind of lid do we want, do we want the lid that pops up, screws on, whatever, the size of the lid is compared to the bottle. We can do all those one at a time if we need to, right? Then mm -hmm. if we decide we like this one shape, let's print out 50 of them. Which and could speed up the pace of, digital, of, of innovation, speed up the pace right. of new products. Instead of me showing you a picture, I show you the item. Right. Now to take it to a focus group, I take the items and let them see it. Yep. So imagine that now where we can now have those custom made for us. And in fact, if we went on a small run, 300, great. Let's just do that. Put them on too. a shelf and actually see how they sell That's in this right. CVS versus that CVS. That's exactly right, right sir. So let's go. Let's go back to what we learned about mid-sized companies. They've got a digital um, operation and they've got a potential digital revolution. Mm -hmm. How digital are they? Right. And I think some of them came down to, well, this is again another great question in that you have companies that are digital because they were born digital. Mm -hmm. And you have others that have had to grow into a digital company. So let's take those in two places, right? So if you and I were to start a health company today and we're going to do billing or something, we're going with Aetna, whatever it is, we're born digital. Nobody's going to send us crates of paper. Mm -hmm. The assumption is we're ready to take all the information digitally. In fact, legislation through the Affordable Care Act and others is going to force us to do that through digital. So healthcare companies are getting pretty advanced in digitization. They have aren't they? to be. Mm -hmm. They have to be. It's a requirement, right? Both just to be in the business and from outside legislation forcing them to do that. Great. So they're born into this space. And frankly, some of them are born in that space because they see a need to help people, right? Mm -hmm. I can speed up the process. I can help you do your billing. How do I help collect all the information around a particular case? I can do that digitally. Mm -hmm. So there's companies that are born that way. If you and I, frankly, the way we're dressed, most likely not, but if we're gonna start a retail company for men's line of clothing, not to pick on you, but I'm looking at well, myself. I'm, no, it's, it's all right, you can pick it. This, this, this is it's an old suit. Okay. But we, it's a fine old it's, suit. It's a, it's a good looking suit. Um, <laughs> So we, serious. We, we would go online, right? So small companies here in Columbus, again, to reference Columbus, we have lots of boutiques. They're not in your space, uh, but many of them started out immediately, immediately pardon me, went digital. Because mm -hmm. where else are we going to sell? We're going to have some people right. walk by the store, but we need to get our presence out as fast as we can. So web, whether we use Amazon Web Services, Google, whatever it happens to be, we're going to put a storefront up, boom, as fast as we can and get our presence out. So they're born digital. Right? You have other companies that started out in a space and realized, I mean, we could probably, there's a little bakery down in German Village. If we went to right now, half his business is done through FedEx, shipping to other parts of the United States, not Columbus, Ohio. So here are small companies that have decided they're in the digital world, whether it's forced on them or they thought that's a great marketplace and they're using that space. So the minute you put up a website, you're global, right? Yeah. I mean, it's called the World Wide Web. For a reason. For a reason. That's right. And so you have to be, and you have to be ready for people. What happens when somebody from the UK says, I'd love you to send 10 quarts of Jenny's ice cream to me. What do we do? Right? A, lot of, a lot of dry ice. That's exactly right. <laughs> Can we do it? So, I mean, again, you look at a company that size, most likely without asking, probably half their business is done digitally. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So it's kind of forced upon them in a sense. And they also were in that space. Now, if you and I were... Uh, you know, making some kind of men's shoes out of leather, we're going to make a hundred pair a year. We may or may not want to be on right? Mm -hmm. Have a storefront online. Mm -hmm. We might not even do that. We might just have a name and a phone number and we're not going to allow any commerce to happen. That's fine. That's their choice. But those other two talk about whether it's healthcare retail and you see in the study, they're the ones on the edge of this because they were either born a digital company or they're forced into it. So most companies. companies have been around for a while and in the middle market, I think the median age is 31. And if mm -hmm. my math is right, that makes the me median age of a middle market company about four years older than net than uh, than uh, the Netscape. Yes. So they were not born digital. They were right. born 
in an analog world and born in a mechanical world. Yes. And we talk about digital transformation. Where are they on the journey? Well, again, some of those companies have finished the first wave, right? Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that went back and finished up their accounting and others. And, and when I say that, it's not to be, uh, to say that they're behind, it's part of it is, given the size of those companies, because they may have been 30 years old, might be slightly larger than these smaller companies in healthcare and retail that we're talking about, uh, it's an effort to become digital, sure. right? It's not a trivial thing. I mean, we've all seen those, oh, we'll put in the new software, no problem, it'll be ready in two weeks, right? right. We yeah. know that. It costs, right? it's a yeah. year of time, it's people, right. it's everything else. So they've gone through that first wave. What they're starting, to, and the other thing is, just to bring it up, is they might have applications now that are already doing things for them, like allocation of resources, helping with their supply chain, determining how they're going to ship things out. Those are great digital applications. They may or may not reflect on that and say, oh yeah, this is, this is, a, this is something that's driven us into the digital economy. They just assume everybody else has. I think you're being right? too optimistic. Okay. I think you're. I mean, I, I think <laughs> we did ask these companies to grade themselves. Oh yes. On digitization. Yes, and they're harsh graders, aren't they? Well, well <laughs> you know, somebody who saw the study said they gave them. They, she thought that they gave them an easy grade, but what was the grade that they gave them? Most often was a C plus, right? So somewhere between a two eight and a three one on a scale of zero to four, and we had mm -hmm. zero, so people mm -hmm. could give themselves an E. So on a scale of zero to four, most likely a two eight to three one. Now, depending on who you are, I tend to think that's a B minus, but C plus, right? It's uh -huh. that half empty, half full kind of conversation, but rightly there, which means they, A, they're harsh graders, B, um, they still said they had great returns, 28%, mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. what, they're, what they were grading themselves on is the length of time it took mm -hmm. to do it, mm -hmm. and the skills and some of the other things that came up with it. The, the fact that there was additional costs, I think, it's mentioned in the study, that they didn't think about before they started so the work? One sense I got from the study is I can do a digital project and it may take two or three years, but I'm going to get a 30% return on it. That's pretty good. Yes. And I can do another and another and another, but I have a real hard time connecting the dots on those projects and getting them to actually turn me into something. I remember Michael Hammer years ago talking about re-engineering, saying you don't want to just automate the cow paths, mm -hmm. that you want to do something other than that. And what we're seeing is automation here, automation, digitization yeah. in spots, yes. but the archipelago never connects into a continent. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. I think, especially as a small company, they have the funding maybe to do something. We're going to upgrade this piece of software. We're going to buy a new piece of software here. The hardest piece is exactly what you described, this overarching. So if you How wanna, do they all connect together? So if you right? want to do that, right? right? Let's, I mean, digitization started in the back office, right? Correct. In a glass house with the guys with pocket pr protectors, right? Correct. If you want to connect the dots and become a digital enterprise, do you, how do you start? Do you, do, should you reverse your mindset and instead of starting in the back, start with the customer, start with the skin, mm. and work in. I mean, as you work with companies, and I know you not only teach, but consult and work with them, if you want, if you get a company that wants to make that leap, right. they're there, they know how to do this stuff, right. but they want to get there. Where do you start? That's a great question as well, too. I think part of it is, it depends on the company and the leadership. Yeah. We can talk about this, how you know digital, Readiness has to be part of the DNA. That's a hard thing to do, to say to somebody, we need you to change your DNA now as a we CEO. We know that evolution takes, I've still right. got, we all know that we've all got Neanderthal DNA that, still in that's us. That's so, correct, you know, so you know, part of that that's says. that's true digitally as well. Right, so part of them feel like it's an, they, they will evolve themselves into a mm -hmm. digital company, slow but sure. Then that's okay, as long as there is what you described, this overarching, I hate to use the word architecture, but let's just put a plan it mm -hmm. says this is how everything's going to work together. Now that can be driven by my IT officer along with my CEO, right? The C-levels have to have this conversation and have to understand where everything's going. Or if you're lucky enough, you're sprouted up as a digital company and everything, right? Like we talked about with the healthcare retail, everything is digital and all has to work together in order for your company to succeed. So I think the onus is on some of the companies that are still, they're 80% of the way there. Meaning we've done the back office, we've done some of this, but how do we make all this connect together instead of having these disparate areas? And that becomes, that's a decision that has to come from executives down, right? Where they embrace mm -hmm. this and have to understand it's trickier because now how do we show value to connect all these things together? And so right? it's almost as if digitization has built up in functions, almost mm -hmm. like stacks in mm -hmm. software terms, right? Right. And, and 
And for these things to connect into digital transformation, it has to move from me thinking of my budget in marketing and sales in ops or whatever it is, right. instead of me thinking of my budget and what I want to do next year and talking to the CIO about what I want to do in my budget, we have to start thinking about what we're doing. We have to move from budget to strategy, yeah. right? And from strategy, take strategy and filter that back down to the budget yes. rather than building it up and hoping that these things connect at some point. Well, also a part of it is, is what happens if you don't do it, right? So okay. I'll use an example. Years ago, when I was young, which was years ago, um, I visited- Two or three. Yeah, just a couple. I visited the Columbus Airport, mm -hmm. right? We went out there to watch how air traffic controllers work. And it's interesting because for many years, the radar used to be at an angle, but it had swivels in the radar screens. And for the simple reason was, when the radar went out, they would take these screens, lay them flat, they had little, look like plastic boats that they would put little slips of paper in, which was all the planes, and then they'd move them by hand, like in a war movie, right, uh -huh. as to where uh -huh. everything's going. How cool. Yeah, but that Very was the cool. default, yeah, right? right? So I think what a lot of companies have to think about is, if we can't get it to work, we're gonna have to shove the screen down and start putting little plastic boats around here to move things around. And sometimes, it, the answer may not be is, are you gonna become digital ready? It's what happens if you don't? Right? So another example always is- And we're not talking about planes colliding in right. this case. We're, we're talking about I competitors can't get getting into my space. That's right. We're talking about I'm falling farther optimal. and farther right. behind. Right. My product development cycle is going to be two prototypes a month and somebody else is doing two prototypes an hour. Right. And I just sort of start right. falling, behind. falling behind. And the other thing is I can't get my information collected together. Right? It's, it's funny. Um, if we look at the digital world, one of the things that everybody kind of takes for granted more is we all have email. Yet, if I took apart our email system today at the university, nothing would get done. That's right. Right? That's so right. part of it also has to be is, for some of these companies, they get so used to, yeah, we did this, we set up an email, we did this stuff here. Yeah, but you're constantly having to worry and make it part of your everyday business and how we're doing it. How do I talk to a customer today? Most times I talk to a customer via email, via Twitter, via text. I mean, all this technology has to be in place for a digital corporation to have communications with the customer, plus the phone, mm -hmm. all that has to be there. If none of that's working or part of it's not working, customer happiness is gonna go down, right? Customer satisfaction will drive down. So it's funny, you have, you have this wave of, we made these changes, now we gotta keep these up to date, we gotta add yep. new things to it yep. as well too. And so let's leave us with one, Final thought from me and then, and then f from you. When okay. you said that, um, you reminded me of the fact that customer expectations are shaped mm -hmm. not just by what you're offering me, mm -hmm. by, by, but by what everybody else is offering me, right. right? So if I'm a bank, I've long since given up on bankers' hours. I know I have to have an ATM. Mm -hmm. I know I have to do all of those things. But I actually now expect 24-7, 365 from wherever I am customer service. Mm -hmm. And that's not because other banks have done it. It's because FedEx has done it and Amazon has done it and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and other people have done it. So the level of expectation in is set and digitally driven not just by my competitors, mm -hmm. but by the way my customers live their lives and they're living multi-screen, omni-channel oh, yeah. lives with everybody else. Yes, sir. And so if the answer, if the question in the study is, how digital are you? And that question is, how digital should you be? Yeah. The point is that the people moving the goalposts are not your competitors, hmm. they're your customers. Yes, sir. And that's the answer to the question of how digital do you need to be. Yeah, just ask them, right? Ask them what, they what they're demanding and what they're seeing from others. And I think you're right. I think if you look today, you and I both, right? We, if you're on your phone and you're trying to do a transaction and if the response time is less than a couple seconds, you already start to think negative thoughts about the, the website that you're on. Either right? that or about my phone. Right, yeah. right. either way. But right. you're al already, the whole <coughs> experience starts to go negative, right? The fact is that you have a preconceived image of what it's going to be like based on Yelp reviews and everything else. And I walk into your store, what it's going to be like. So I have all these expectations that are driven to me through this digital world that we live in today. And to keep up with those expectations and to maybe more importantly manage the expectations of what mm -hmm. people think is yes, that's part of being a digital enterprise. And if you don't do it, guess what? People are gonna stop coming. And with that, we hope you don't stop coming. 
But Ralph Greco, thank you very yes, much. Yes, sir. Uh, the study is How Digital Are You? The website is middlemarketcenter.org. And thanks a lot.